Jimmy Vickers' road to the Colorado Golf Hall of Fame started in Wichita, Kansas, where he and his brothers grew up playing Wichita Country Club. But they also grew up playing golf in the summers at the Broadmoor. Spent the uh, pretty much the summer in, in, in uh, Colorado Springs, either uh, leasing a house or staying at the hotel, but we sort of grew up in, in there in, in a lot of ways. My brother Jack was born there. It was a wonderful place to be. You got to learn the etiquette of golf and work with uh, the pros, Ed Dudley and Bill Trombley was there. Jimmy stayed in Colorado and attended Regis University. He also joined Lakewood Country Club, where he would play with and learn from more future Colorado Golf Hall of Famers, like Babe Lind and John Kraft. Babe was uh, considered the best player in Colorado. He had the best short game in golf that I ever saw. I think Phil Rogers was number two and Phil was Phil was a magician, but Babe was a double magician. Babe and Jimmy were the featured duo for Lakewood in the state team championships, and John Kraft captained the team. I learned an awful lot playing with Babe Land. I owe John Kraft an awful lot of thanks for the stuff he showed me, uh, especially the psychology of match play. Well, it wasn't long before Jimmy put it all to good use. In 1949, he found himself in the final match of the CGA State Amateur Match Play Championship at Denver Country Club. It was going good, and I'd never won a tournament. I'd been a quarter-finalist and a semi-finalist prior to that, but I'd never won a tournament. In order to make the finals against Bob, he had to defeat another Hall of Famer, Lou North, and then Paul Gore. Well, I think the three of them were the top five players in Colorado, amateur players, and probably Bob was right at the top. But, I, I, you know, it was like murderer's row for me to try to get through this thing. So. Well, Jimmy entered the finals against Bob with a lot of people pulling for him, and a little bit of advice arrived via Western Union from Ed Dudley. After the first 18 holes, Jimmy was two down. And we uh, started in the afternoon, and, and uh, I made a birdie at one, and, and uh, one down, and then the real turning point of the match, I thought, was on the second hole. I hit my third shot over the green under a tree, I got under the tree and hacked it out into uh, to now I'm about five yards off the green, shooting five and I'm still away, and I hold it for five. And when Bob missed a short par putt and halved the hole, momentum was officially Jimmy's. And that was a great victory for me and the first victory of what I would consider a, a, a good strong tournament. And I I was I was on heaven. <laughs> Well, in 1950, Jimmy set out to defend his title, this time at the familiar confines of Lakewood Country Club. Once again, he found himself in the final match, this time against Paul Gore. With some words of wisdom from John Kraft and the support of one of his biggest fans, Jimmy would become the first player in over a quarter of a century to win back-to-back -back state amateur match play titles. My mother came up to watch it with a friend of hers, and, and uh, they had a car for her to follow the follow the. Uh, follow the match in a car. And we were on the 13th holes of three par over there. And uh, I made about a 20 footer for a birdie there. And she's in the car and starts honking the horn like, like they do at, in polo when they score, score a goal. So that got everybody's attention. Talk about getting everyone's attention. That same year, Jimmy played in the Western Amateur. And in the first round, drew defending champion, reigning British amateur champion, and number one ranked amateur in the world, Frank Stranahan. So I drew him in the first round, and we had a great match, and, and uh, I won it on the 19th hole with a birdie, one extra hole. And of course, it was uh, pandemonium. Uh, they had a big crowd, a lot of press, and Frank had made a statement down there that we, the Dallas Country Club was rather a short course. He said they ought to be playing the, the Junior Ladies Championship here. And that was headlines in the sports and it really made everybody in Dallas mad at Frank. I had a big guy, there was a big gallery and they were pulling for me. But it was a, it was a big, big win. Talk about big wins. Jimmy, who had already been recruited by the University of Oklahoma, played in his second NCAA championship in 1952. After going two extra holes in the semifinals to get to the finals, he found himself one up on the 36th hole of the final match. Eddie had about a five footer for a birdie and I had about a 20 footer for a birdie that broke about five feet and I hold it. And uh, I had a total emotional breakdown <laughs> when it ended. I just I couldn't hold it together. 
but it was uh, really, really something to win the NCAA in it. In a three-year period, Jimmy had won consecutive Colorado State Amateur titles and lost in the semifinals trying to win three in a row. And he had won the NCAA championship. He had defeated the world's number one ranked amateur. So for an encore in 1953, Jimmy defeated Gene Littler in the semifinals en route to a runner-up finish in the Trans-Mississippi Championship. How good were these two? Stranahan and Gene Littler both won PGA Tour events as amateurs. Stranahan in the 1940s and Gene Littler in the early 1950s. Uh, so Jimmy had great accomplishments uh, beating those, those two fine players. Other great accomplishments for Jimmy include qualifying for the 1958 U.S. Open at Southern Hills. He qualified again for the U.S. Open the following year and played at Wingfoot. Jimmy also returned home to Wichita Country Club and won the 1964 Kansas Amateur. In 1965, Jimmy finished fifth in the U.S. Amateur. That earned him a spot in the 1966 Masters where he nearly made the cut. Jimmy also played in 40 Bing Crosby National Pro Amps and won it in 1977. Jimmy, of course, had countless top finishes in the Broadmoor Invitationals over the years. And in 1989, he won the Senior World Golf Championships at the Broadmoor. The following year, he successfully defended his title and he won it a third time in 1993. Jimmy was also on the U.S. Senior International Team for 12 years, where he competed against Great Britain and Canada. It's a really competitive, a really full of gentlemen playing, and, and, uh, and they have a real good time at night. <laughs> and so the, that fit me just fine. <laughs> Another thing that fit Jimmy just fine was the role of player recruiter when his brother Jack, founder of Castle Pines Golf Club, wanted to bring the PGA Tour to Colorado. He and Jimmy put their heads together, and soon the International at Castle Pines became a reality. Well, we both worked, we knew practically all the pros. Not all of them, but we knew a great deal of them. We, we knew the ones that really counted, too. So, uh, you know, we, we shared on that, and exchanged a lot of thoughts. And as far as the format was concerned, we were trying to come up with something a little challenging, a little different. He wanted to have a match play tournament. And he called me and uh, said that. And I said, well, it's just not compatible with television. But he said, well, think of something. So I used to play with the Kansas City Country Club with Tommy Watson's father. And they played a game called Birdie Bogey. And I took that and uh, kind of reframed it. The main deal was that par could be, had to be zero or the score would be too high like a basketball game. So I started with that. The press would call it Modified Stapleford, and the International began its 21-year run in Colorado. The pros came and played and didn't like it. Next year they didn't like it quite as bad, and by the third or fourth year they loved it. In addition to his role with the International, Jimmy has served as a director for the Trans-Mississippi Golf Association, the Western Golf Association, and the Evans Scholar Foundation. But despite all of his contributions to the game and amazing accomplishments as a player, Jimmy may be best known for being one of the most beloved and entertaining gentlemen to have ever played the game. And his brother Jack knows why. Jimmy's worked more on his jokes than I have. I was working while he was telling jokes. And so I'm not as good at that as he is. We've done a few things at Castle Pines since I was fortunate enough to become president. And, and uh, one of them was to redo what we called the Upper Terrace. And we uh, named it the Founders Lounge after our 12 great founders. Uh, but we wanted a little extra touch. And several people thought about it. And I said, well, what if we call the bar Jimmy's Bar? Because we were going to have a full bar up there that we didn't have before. And there's actually a picture of Jimmy there and in all his accomplishments. Jimmy's only comment was that there wasn't a bright enough light on the picture. But we're taking care of that. <laughs> and tonight will shine an even brighter light on Jimmy as we welcome him to the Colorado Golf Hall of Fame.